Greetings, and bienvenue, mine crew. Thank you for returning to this broadcast. And welcome to new viewers joining us for the first time. If you like a video, then feel free to subscribe. It's not too much of a story, but it's strange, spooky enough to scare servicemen. And it is true. My cousin was in the U.S. Army as a helicopter pilot in Afghanistan. For those that don't know, the Afghans have been in perpetual war since the 70s, and the Soviets were trying to conquer the country for a while. The U.S. Army occupies a lot of the old Soviet structures, since they are the only buildings around that aren't mud huts. When my cousin was stationed at Bagram, or Kandahar, not asking him to clarify which base he was at, he'd think I'm weird. He and a couple other men slept in an old, decommissioned air traffic control tower. This tower was riddled with bullet holes and was the site of one of the Soviets' last stands before they gave up on the country. The place had been abandoned for decades when my cousin moved in, and after a couple of nights, he and the other guys realized there was a hole in the corner of the first floor. They had moved a dresser drawer into the corner, and it crumbled the patch of floor underneath. After someone poked a flashlight through, they realized there was a basement below and could make out guns, camouflage clothes down there. My cousin and his buddies rummaged around, trying to find the door to the basement. After knocking on the walls, they eventually found a disguised, hidden door, boarded up from the other side, locked. They eventually broke through the door and realized the staircase down to the basement had been blown apart. My cousin said it looked like the previous occupants used a couple of grenades, since the blasts weren't huge, but were enough to demolish the stairs. There were dead bodies down there as well, basically mummified over so many years. There wasn't even a smell left, to give you an impression of the state of these corpses. The weird part is thinking about what happened. For whatever reason, these mummies had boarded up the door from the inside and seemingly trapped themselves within by blowing up the stairs. Meanwhile, the people on the outside hid the door. My cousin and the rest of the men in that building could not understand what was the thought process there. It seemed very abnormal, and it was only a few weeks before the troops moved out of that tower on the orders of command. My cousin is still in the military, but for whatever reason, the sight of the basement was enough to keep his mind running loops on it. He's seen plenty of people die. He flies evac helicopters into combat. But this is his big moment, where he pauses to think about it over and over again. Something screwed up happened down there that the Soviets seemed to want to hide before they had to retreat. I'm not sure if it was disease prevention, with the mummies having decided to trap themselves in and run out their internal clocks. I'm not sure if the mummies just didn't want to return home after failing to conquer Afghanistan. Maybe they weren't going to get evac'd, and figured it was better to die on their terms than get tortured to death by the proto-Taliban groups. But that all leaves us with the question, why did they hide the door? Spooky to me is not skinwalker stories. It's stuff like this, where the logic you try to apply to the situation breaks down, where there's some serious unknown variables that resulted in people thinking it'd be better to self-terminate themselves and be hidden away. I spent some time in Afghanistan as a part of the U.S. military. I was an infantryman and was a part of a quick response force for the Joint Air Force and Army Bagram base. Radicalists would often set up mortars on blocks of ice to fire at the base to ensure they had enough time to leave the area before a quick response force would enter. Working night shifts as part of a quick response force around 200 hours, alarm blares, a mortar hits close to the base, radio comes on, Anon, gather at the main gate in three minutes, grab my trusty M4, and head to the gate. Sergeant and two other soldiers entered the Humvee, plus myself. Head up to coordinates given to us by command. Begin heading to the mortar location, up the mountain. Find mortar, smoking, and water all over the ground. Secure area, report back to command, all clear. Begin heading down the mountain when we hear crunching. Sounds like bones snapping. We move to the source of the sound. Get within 30 meters of the sound. 
Sergeant signals flashlights on. All turn on lights and see a figure. Incredibly pale, dirt all over. Massive legs, at least four feet tall and 36 inches wide. Tendons and veins visible throughout its legs. Spinal cord and shoulder blades appear as if it is starving. Turns to look at us. Eyes look like the reverse of a human's. Completely black eyes, light blue pupils. Screeches extremely loudly at a very high pitch. Birds fly off. Creature bolts at an inhuman pace. Sergeant orders a perimeter. Inspect area. Was eating goat carcasses. Organs everywhere. Sergeant orders to move slowly down the mountain back to the vehicle while aiming up the mountain. We get back to the vehicle, go back to base. Never tell anyone or talk about what we saw. To this day I have no idea what the hell I saw. It appears in my dreams almost every night. Has anyone seen anything like this? I'm desperate for answers. I had a very good friend who I'll call Sherlock, because he believed very much in similar philosophies to Sherlock, as in deductive reasoning, the purity of a priori logic. I've heard him over the radio when he's being shot at and having RPGs fired at him, and he sounded as calm and relaxed as somebody on holiday in an ice cream shop, specifying what flavor they wanted. For example, Cucumber Crisp 071, I'm under fairly heavy sustained fire. It looks like part of my fuselage just gave way over. That sort of thing. I'm fairly sure he was slightly autistic because he'd just wait until the base told him to pull out or whatever. He also had no mercy. If he had authorization to fire, he'd light them up. No qualms, no limitations. Anyway, I've seen Sherlock quake like a leaf in the winter wind. It must have been around 3 a.m., and there was nothing at all to do. I was playing poker against the computer and winning, another friend of mine reading Kant on my bed, when he walked into my room. Pretty unusual, because he always knocked. He delivered some supplies to an outpost about 70 kilometers away from the main base. Not deep in hostile territory, but hostile enough that you'd expect an RPG or two when you supplied them, or took out the wounded, which is mainly what Sherlock did, even volunteering to do it. He'd sat down in the afternoon and helped unload the supplies, mainly medical, ammunition, and tools, and stuck around taking requests from the commanding officer, who was running low on water and water purification tablets. A few privates were on duty in the dusk, and one of them freaked, saying he could see something through thermals that he couldn't see in person. This piqued Sherlock's curiosity, so he had a look. Sure enough, when he looked through thermals, he could see the shape of a man about 200 meters down the path, but looking with binoculars, couldn't see anything, even with night vision. This is quite common in Afghanistan. It's reported uncommonly. Despite being an uncommon event, it's always quite unnerving when it happens. But according to Sherlock, he wasn't unnerved, just his deductive reasoning pricking up. First, he thought the thermals were dodgy, so he used another set, then another set. Then he thought the binoculars were bad, so he used another pair, which weren't just thermal imaging, but infrared night vision. Rather than the shitty green tinted type, it was a grayscale type, which showed significant detail. Now, on the infrared grayscale, he could see it. Apparently, it was a human in everything other than having a head. The body was human, perfectly proportioned, but there was no head. Now, the other night vision didn't show this. Sherlock, armed with nothing other than our standard issue Browning High Power, and probably just a single magazine, strolled 200 meters down the path to see if he could see anything. Apparently not, though he said it felt unusually chilly and he did feel quite uneasy. It was on his way back when he heard soldiers shouting. Looking behind him, he saw four or five putrefied bodies shambling after him. He described the smell as rancid and their look as if they had contracted the vilest leprosy. They were moving pretty quickly, and he could see body parts, fingers, hands, even an entire arm, drop off. When he said they were like the walking dead, I felt a chill go up my spine, and my friend reading Kant actually looked up at us. Sherlock said he shouted a warning to the bodies, apparently rotting as if dead for a few days, appendages and torsos swollen from the sun, and as they continued to gain ground on him, began opening fire. Despite one of them being hit several times, losing most of its shoulder and through the stomach, it single-mindedly continued pursuing Sherlock, who, for the first time ever, sprinted away. A rifleman at the outpost shot them with a more high-powered weapon and killed, re-killed, one of them. As soon as one of them went lifeless, 
The others would single-mindedly stuff their faces full of flesh, just tearing it off limbs and bodies. No shame, no disgust, like they hadn't eaten for days. At this point, the fellow reading Kant piped up. He'd heard of similar stories in his journeys to outposts. Some American soldiers, badly injured and delirious in the sun, told him how they had seen their brothers in arms set upon by filthy Mujahideen and ripped apart, alive. Limbs ripped from bodies, heads from necks, and how they would rip the flesh off with their long-nailed fingers, gouging it out or bite it off the bones. They had said only fire or high-velocity weapons, not small arms, could stop them. Afghan soldiers, when mortally wounded, prefer to self-terminate themselves than be captured, because they've heard the stories and know the folklore. It is true they self-terminate themselves. I've seen it. I must also admit, as I became more experienced and hardened to the oddness of Afghanistan, I also heard quite a few of these stories myself, to the point where they don't even worry me anymore. I think I even saw a herd of them rampage through a village. But it's Afghanistan, so they could have been tripping on opiates. My stepfather was a Green Beret, retired major, and he spent five plus years in and out of Afghanistan. He told me a story when I graduated high school while almost blackout drunk about why they should have nuked Hasty. In his ramblings, he mentioned about a specific scenario where he had to engage a small Taliban group, around 11-ish people, on the outskirts of the town near a walled compound. Naturally, the Army Special Forces wiped them out while leaving no survivors. However, for some reason, command ordered them to secure and sit in the compound after clearing it for explosives and additional people. He said they were stuck in the compound for around eight hours, when the very dead Taliban began to get up and try to attack them without weapons, and while screaming almost inhumanly near the end of their stay in the compound. People whose entire stomachs had holes larger than a bowling ball blown in it got up to attack them hours after having been killed. He said they went down and stopped moving when their heads were blown off. He mentioned one guy he shot at close range had milky white eyes. They got out of there when allowed and reported it up the combat operations center. However, apparently nothing came of it, and the excuse was that they were playing dead, even though most of them had massive holes in them with no guts, etc., from being show with high cal weapons to try and take them off guard. He never saw anything like that again, but I saw the look in his drunk ass eyes when he relayed this story to me, and it hit me deep because I don't think he was bullshitting. The human body isn't as fragile as people think it is. Anger and drugs are great at blocking out pain, too. It was probably just tweakers. I've never served in the military, but I know people who have. According to them, the real spoopy things in those regions is all the freaky wildlife that comes out at night. It ranges from large, unidentifiable insects to vaguely humanoid things that sometimes walk on two legs that will steal whatever grabs their attention. My buddy also said that the locals would talk about witches that lived in the mountains and said he would frequently see what looked like an old woman in a white robe with long black hair over her face and that they'd vanish if you looked away. Be me, forward observer in the U.S. Army. Nine months into what turned into a 14-month deployment to Afghanistan, out hunting some Taliban bomb maker, chased him and his buddies up a mountain, but it got dark before we could catch them though. Lay in on a downslope. I go make a hasty OP 50 meters from the rest of the company and get comfy. Sun sets, no moon, low cloud cover. Break out this 50,000 forward looking infrared scope and slap it on my rifle. Start scanning my area and waiting to get shot by a sniper. See something across the saddle and up the opposite hill, roughly 300 meters away. Man shaped thing stands out like a torch in the infrared. Just standing there, not moving. Obviously knows we're there. Call out possible contact and the sniper team comes over. They see nothing through their night vision scopes. Call me a liar and leave. I look and it's still there in the infrared. Spend next hour watching each other. See more movement uphill. See a lot of movement uphill. Oh, screw me, dot JPEG. It's on bomb maker called his boys and now they're assaulting our position. They run right past the infrared shape, not even acting like it's there. I lose track of it during the firefight, but pick the shape back up maybe an hour later starting to convince myself it's not actually there until it moves. It starts walking the battlefield, slowly moving from body to body and heading in our direction. I go cold and my stomach drops out. Put sight on target, pull trigger, send bullet. Nothing happens. Proceed to do controlled mag dump at 150 meters. Still nothing. 
reloading when the platoon sergeant stops me and asks what I'm shooting at. Give him a rifle. Point. He sees nothing. Pulls me off the line for a break. Never see the thing again. Sometimes I feel like it's out there, and I start to panic knowing I can't see it. I also wonder about what else is out there that I can't see. Deployed to Afghanistan 2009. Around Argandab River and Panjwai. Lots of IEDs. Lots of small troops in contact. Company gets tasked to clamp down on Taliban freedom of movement. Platoons get sent out to occupy Afghan compounds in a village known for producing IED material. Spread out, but mutually supporting in the event of someone getting overrun, etc. We go through with PSYOPs and their backpack loudspeakers and tell everyone to GTFO while we are conducting our operations. Streams of villagers getting out of Dodge. We have our pick of the houses and set up our little perimeter and wait for the Taliban to come to us. First night, no contact. Dawn of day, two sporadic RPK fire from Woodline. Call in AH-67. Two enemies killed in action. Push out to begin clearing the village. We search houses all day and find tons of HME and IED components. Worth mentioning that we swept all the paths we took with minesweepers and found a few pressure plate IEDs and blew them in place. So at the end of day two, we walked back to our outposts without any concern. Secure perimeter on outside of the village and total control inside city limits. Second night sustained attack against another platoon. The strange thing is that some of the fire comes from inside the village where we had cleared during the day. Afghan army guys are freaking out about the Taliban. Terp tells us they think the Taliban are werewolves. No shit, werewolves. Third day, step off for more sweeps of the village, walking on same path as day before guy steps on IED, loses leg from knee down. WTF, that was all cleared the day before. Day passes uneventfully. Night three sustained attack against my platoon, again from inside the village. How the hell are they getting past our perimeter? Afghans go on and on about how Taliban are shape-shifting werewolves. Day four, another IED, another casualty. This is starting to get weird. Inside one of the houses we cleared the day before we found a dead goat. Violently shredded to bits, blood smeared everywhere. It's gruesome. We step out and try to ignore that. Noonish. Weapons squad is set in local support by fire. Second squad is searching the house next to my squad and the third squad is pulling the inner cordon. The rest of my company is set up in their outposts and a sister company is set up on the other side of the village. All of a sudden, movement. A grenade comes over the wall and explodes. Luckily, no one is hurt. Shit hits the fan about 10 meters away from me. Somehow a squad of Taliban had gotten right outside the courtyard my squad was in. Vicious firefight ensues. Third squad engages in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Two soldiers wounded, five Taliban killed. Pull out and head back to our house on the perimeter. Another IED, another wounded in action. That night, rolling attacks on all the platoons all night from inside and outside the perimeter. The word comes down, we pull out at first light. The whole company assembles on a nearby hill and watches as three 500-pound bombs are dropped on the village. Load up on the trucks and roll out. All told, the company had one soldier die from his injuries on the medevac bird and five more wounded. The Taliban lost an estimated about 20 to 30. I'm still baffled about how they got in and out of our perimeter for days on end. We had optics, guards on post 24 seven and roaming patrols constantly. It was freaky to say the least and generally a completely messed up situation. Be me 23 E4 in the army. First deployment all amped up to go do soldier stuff. We fly through Germany then into Bagram, Afghanistan. Boring, I spend a week getting everything set up for out-hop flights to our outstation assignments. Fly to Kabul, then to some tiny outpost in the middle of nowhere in the mountains. The closest village is Azro. Tasked with maintaining patrols and security to ensure terrorist traffic from Pakistan is minimized, limiting freedom of movement and whatever. Patrol in the hot mountains in thin-ass air with three-day assault packs in the squad. Day in, day out. Start hearing rumors of some kind of animals in the mountains supposedly some kind of wildcats or something. Don't believe it, this place is just a pile of godforsaken rocks. Eventually, we switch to night shifts and repeat. After a few months, we had a firefight with some assholes trying to get the drop on us in the middle of the night. This lasts for like three hours. Trees and large rocks make it hard to see enemies even with night vision goggles. Lots of yelling, shooting, and stress. Finally, the shooting stops. We got them all so we check everyone to be sure nobody got hit and didn't realize it somehow. Everyone's good so the squad stops security and heads to make sure shuts actually cleared up. 
radio into the outstanding and let them know we're really good and what's our plan. We get the green light and are told to check in every hour to give spot reports till we've verified security. As we get closer, we start to hear death rattle of a select few who haven't quite died yet, but are on their last few breaths. Identify and secure, no weapons, the locals are non-threat, etc. We begin to pull security on our position as we think we've got all the hajis identified and secured. That's when our designated marksman notices a blood trail leading up the mountain away from the group of bodies. Lots of disturbed rocks and earth. Lots of blood, and I mean a lot. We split into two teams, one goes up the hill, mine pulls security on the corpses. Twenty minutes later we hear running, shout out the challenge, get a frantic out of breath scream of the password back four or five times in a row. Let's call them Johnson and Smith. They're covered in blood. There's no way it's theirs, but the rest of their team is gone, and so are their weapons. We start drilling them and trying to get Smith to stop stuttering. Johnson isn't saying anything, just staring blankly into the distance, mumbling something about cats we are trying to figure out what happened. The radio telephone operator is already on it and calling back to the outstation requesting we get somebody to put some eyes on the area of operations. Predict feed or something. We need to know what the hell they ran into. Outstation says they are working on it and says they're sending out another squad to assist. Says it's going to be at least two hours because no way are we getting a vehicle near us. Terrain is too shitty. Finally, Smith stops stuttering and just starts screaming. One of the other guys slaps a hand over his mouth and can still hear him screaming through his nose. Johnson gets loud enough and stops muttering so we can hear him. Apparently, they were following the blood trail and came up on a pile of dismembered bodies. They were busy being mindful of the sight when Johnson and Smith noticed the rest of their team was gone. They ready up their weapons and start trying to locate their team, whisper yelling through their teeth. Out of nowhere, they get knocked over by the torso and leg of one of their team members. Look to their left where it came from and see this big cat-like thing dismembering another guy from the team, several other bodies next to it. The thing has these huge human-like hands with short hooked claws. They panic and just bolt. Smith says, where's my weapon? Dude didn't even realize he lost it till just then. The second squad shows up after a while. We head out to where the carnage is supposed to be. Nobody can find a thing save for Smith's weapon and the advanced combat helmet of one of the now MIA team members and what looks to be torn up earth, like how dry dirt gets after a dog marks its territory then scratches the ground. The next few weeks were weird. We never found the bodies, never saw this cat thing Smith and Johnson talked about. Never found any of the missing weapons, nothing. The only trace was their debrief, their blood-soaked uniforms and the helmet from one of the MIA guys. Sometimes I wonder if it was all in our heads, like some sort of mass hallucination. That we saw something just too screwed up and couldn't process it or something and replaced it with a monster. I hope I never know. If it's any worse than that, I never want to know what really happened. Be an Army, Afghanistan. At Bagram, Parwan Providence. Be Me 2013. Working base security for a tour. Having to drive around base responding to shots fired, IEDs going off. People walking around in restricted areas close to base. A few nights after a major attack on the base. Over 700 Sandys dead. Three International Security Assistance Force men dead. Weird things starts happening around the time the major attack happened. Our motion sensors, ground lasers and other base defenses start malfunctioning. Constant alerts saying that our inner fence lines have been compromised. Almost every night this happens around 200 hours. One night as we were scanning out outer fence line with night vision. See seven combatants just sitting there by our exterior fence line. They are just standing there, looking straight at us, like they see us and know we are there. It's dark. We aren't emitting light and we know for 100% sure they cannot see us. Buddy gets the creeps, wants to alert CO. They are way in the designated shoot zone. Lethal force is authorized where they are. Grab my thermal camera, scan the area. No people are standing out there. This is flat terrain, no holes, craters, or divots, not even rocks. There is a solid mile that is cleared out and they were way past that mile. See the blued silhouettes of five combatants. Hand over thermal to Buddy. He's so creeped out and he about cries. I'm back on night vision. See only one combatant. Okay, what the hell, man? Watching this ghost, he's eyeing my soul. I blink and the ghost is charging straight for us. I yell open fire and my buddy racks his 240 and sprays the area and unloads a 300 round belt. CO comes out. CO yells at us asking why they were firing. Tell CO about the whole thing. 
Me and Buddy are visually rocked up. CO laughs at us. Laughs. Me and Buddy have the most messed up mixed look ever. Tells us, so you guys seen that too, blah blah blah. You're not the only one who saw that. What? CO said this place is haunted as shit. Tells us there's been more than 2,000 confirmed kills here. Tells us not to tell the rest of the platoon for morale purposes. Training incident. Tell three other trusted dudes. One dude on night patrol, same thing happens to him. Don't go to Afghanistan, this place is haunted. Two combat tours and I've seen some unexplained shit happen. Another story from my best friend. Had told me about it one drunken night. Be in army. Be 2014. At Camp Bastion at center of operation. Preparing for a night village raid. Which was very uncommon. I'm talking about finding a four-leaf clover in a patch of dirt. CO briefs us on our objectives. Search and destroy. Supposed to sneak into the villages and find weapons and IEDs blow up said buildings hiding the various items. Night raids almost never happen. I mean, we're not special forces. This was very weird. CO tells the briefees that this is top secret and considered need to know. Everyone's weirded out by now. Leave tomorrow that night. We have three people who worked for the Alphabet Soup. He couldn't remember who they worked for accompanying us. They carried these bio suits. What you see in those zombie movies. Fast forward to the next night. Everyone is getting psyched. Hellman Province is like the meat grinder. Guys die way too much out there. Get orders that the raid has changed a bit. A bit. Half the teams will separate out. His team was to go into the farm side of the town. Another team took the main center. Have these black suits riding with us. Not the typical black suits, they knew how to handle weapons. Didn't flinch when the .50 vibrated the Humvee. Fast forward two hours. The team starts pulling into the villages. We had a big spotlight on our front of the Humvees. Suits order them to turn the spotlight on. They ignore them, typical I don't take orders from you. After a few minutes of arguing, they turn it on. Round a corner wall. Four combatants standing outside of a little metal building. Size of a hut. They give the gunner a very weird look. Suits tell the gunner to open fire. Can't unless we're being shot at. They start running towards the three Humvees they have that meth head look at them. The gunner opens fire. Red everywhere. A few seconds later, six combatants run out of the shack, shaking their hands in the air. They have this weird-ass look in their eyes, too. They charge the first Humvee. They start to punch the ballistic glass and actually leave indents in it. The second Humvee opens fire. The suits order everyone to stay in the vehicles. Suits and his squad get out of the Humvee. Suits put on their bio suits or whatever. As standard procedure, we must check the dead for intel. They tell them that they must not go near the bodies or the blood or bad things will happen. Bad things. They then told them that they'll take care of them after they're through here. They follow them to the metal hut. Suit tells them that they need to stay outside because something bad is inside. Fast forward 30 minutes into it. They come out with something in biohazard bags. They then tell them to throw some Comp 4 and some incendiary grenades. One of his squad mates walks in through the door. He yells, holy shit. The squad peers inside. They see what appears to be either a really fancy meth lab or a biological weapons lab. They get the chills and they blow the lab to the ground. Suits check the squad mates with those blue flashlights. Everyone clears inspection. Two of the suits drag all the bodies that we smoked into a pile. They ask us to throw some of the Humvee's gas and burn them quick. They burn the bodies. Suits take off gear and throw it on top of the burning combatants. Suits mutter that it's not good to be around this area for much longer. OP is called off and they were to return to base ASAP. The suits debrief them saying that it was a meth lab of some sorts. Everyone in the company is in fear for the rest of the deployment. TDLR. My buddy's company either destroyed a meth lab or a chemical weapons lab on the down low and cannot legally speak about it. They violated multiple Geneva laws and did shady stuff. I have one. And it is about Great Uncle Donnie. Afghanistan 2010. Deployed into the Horn. On a dismounted patrol. Boom. RPG impact over us. We start taking fire from RPKs and RPDs. We deploy and start taking firing positions. I am firing my saw. Then I see a flash of light. Then I went deaf and blind after the flash and boom. An RPG explodes right in front of me. I am breathing heavily on my back when I regain my sight. Bleeding from several parts of my body. It hurts, man. All I can think about is wanting to sleep the pain off. 
I feel like someone just punched me in the chest. I open my eyes and see a man wearing an old helmet. He is looking me over and then yells, I got you, buddy. I feel myself being picked up on my feet and he walks me back to our MRAP. He puts me down on the ramp and disappears. I woke up in a field hospital. They got most of the shrapnel out of me. My command team comes in and tells me the story where I blacked out wounded. I apparently got up in the middle of the firefight, held out an arm and staggered like I was a zombie all the way to the medical MRAP. I was medically discharged from the army in mid-2011. At home helping grandparents rearrange and organize, going through old boxes of photos. I freeze at one photo. It is a photo of Great Grandma, Great Grandpa with Great Aunt Stella, Great Uncle Paul, Great Uncle Bob, Grandpa Mike, and a soldier in uniform. The soldier? It was the man who saved my life in Afghanistan. Grandpa Mike tells me about Uncle Donnie. Great Uncle Donnie was in the 32nd Infantry Division. He died July 27, 1942 in Papua New Guinea. He was posthumously given the Bronze Star with Valor for braving heavy enemy fire to save a wounded comrade. After dropping the wounded man, he turned right around to rejoin the fight. He didn't make it one step forward before he was hit in the chest by a bullet. I hope that you enjoyed tonight's broadcast. If you enjoyed tonight's story, then please subscribe to the channel as more green texts will appear daily. A new broadcast will appear when the clock strikes midnight central time. Remember to check out the Odyssey page in the description for a second archive of the channel's videos. There's also a Rumble archive as a backup.